All right, guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're talking S2000. So I've had it for almost two months now, put maybe 600 miles on it. Let me tell you what I've done. So overall, I love this car, but let me tell you, it's not all fun and games. There was already over a couple thousand dollars I had to put right up front and the car almost left me stranded the other day. So what have I replaced with this car so far? Let's see. VVT solenoid, which is basically causing a leak on the engine block itself. A catalytic converter with O2 sensor, front brake pad and rotors. And then lastly, what did I do? Clutch fluid replacement. So let me explain this. When I went out driving with one of my friends, we went up to the mountains. 50 minutes later, driving in like 80 degree weather, higher altitude, I noticed that my clutch pedal was getting a little bit more soft. Uh, ultimately, right before we got to the trail, the clutch pedal itself became super limp. Like I was pressing it, there was no feel to it, and then ultimately it just stuck completely onto the ground. So I knew I had this happen to me before. I had a O2 RSX, I had that car for about 10 years. The car did the same thing to me. Basically, I was guessing it was the clutch slave cylinder, master cylinder. So I kind of just parked it, just you know, let it cool down. We still enjoyed my friend's car. We drove around 30 minutes later, I came back into the car. I still had some play in it, thank God, because if I wasn't able to get this car into gear and make it back home, I called up a tow through my insurance. They were quoting me $400 tow in order to bring it back home. So a pretty big stretch. Honestly, that probably would have cost more than what I was thinking a clutch slave cylinder or master cylinder would have cost. I lucked out. Like I said, I was able to put the car into gear and make it back home. I was, as soon as I got off the highway and the freeway, I actually ended up hitting every green light. So. Couldn't be more grateful for that. Uh, basically, I got home, it was bothering me. You know, just another repair that needed to be done. Uh, I was looking up and there's this Honda S2000 guru on the forums, his name is Billman250. A lot of people, they have this issue where the clutch pedal just goes completely limp. This Billman guy was explaining that 90% of the time, if you just change out the fluid and then you routinely change it out every 5,000 miles, it will completely get rid of the leak. So I was thinking, do I really not have to change out the whole slave cylinder or master cylinder? So to me, it was wishful thinking, but I figured, you know, let me just go ahead, buy the things and, you know, see if it works. But, you know, knowing my luck, whenever I have a broken car, it's always going to be the most expensive repair that fixes the issue. So anyways, I bought the fluid. I bought the turkey baster. If you look it up on the forums, if you just find the clutch fluid replacement, really easy fix. Basically, what I recommend when you buy this car, check the fluids, because apparently this is such a common issue. So when you check the fluid, if the original owner, you know, wasn't keeping up with this, you're gonna notice that the fluid is completely like sludge. And all of that basically is, you know, wear and tear. And then when you start contaminating the fluid, it builds up, that's what actually causes the leak. So what I learned from the forums is 80% of the time when you just change out the fluid, it's going to fix the leak. They call it a gravity bleed method. So I did that, it took me about two hours and problem's been solved ever since. The clutch feels even better than it did before. Still super stoked that I was able to fix that whole issue, spending only 40 bucks doing it myself rather than $600 towing it to the shop just to have them tell me that the slave cylinder or the master cylinder was out. So just something to keep in mind. Other things that I did to the car, so I did the VVT solenoid, a catalytic converter with O2 sensor. I changed out the front brake pads and the rotors. Some things that I still need to do, the uh, timing chain tensioner. Basically what that is, when your OEM timing chain tensioner wears out, when it does, not if it does, it's going to cause some type of ticking or rattle that's heard from around this area. Basically what that causes is the timing chain to get a little bit loose because, you know, the tensioner is starting to fail. And then ultimately, you know, if you neglect it, it can, what they say, lead to catastrophic uh, issues. And I do not want to know how much it costs to replace this F-Series motor. But anyways, that's something that still needs to be done. Other than that, I've only had it for two months now. I put a pretty good amount of money just doing some maintenance mods. The old me would have, you know, saved up for coilovers, new wheels, new exhaust. So other than that, 
Uh, I did a lot of research on how to take care of the convertible top because I know when that one goes out, it's gonna be like $3,000 to fix. Sun here in Vegas is really strong, so I don't want it to be burning the holes. So I found this protectant vinyl spray. It's called 303. This is actually a vinyl top rather than a cloth top. It fits the OEM one, at least. And that's the whole thing. Like, yeah, you know, this is a Honda. Everyone says they're super reliable, but you know, at the end of the day, it's still a 20 plus almost year old sports car. You know, it has almost 100,000 miles. There's gonna be issues with it, but I think luckily because it is a Honda, you know, when it does have issues and when I do need to fix it, it's not gonna bankrupt me. So that's what's been done so far. What else do I need to do to it? Um, so the timing chain tensioner that's on the list, uh, suspension is a little bit tired, it's very crashy and it's kind of on its way out. I would like to, you know, replace all four and refresh the bushings as well. Uh, it's still on original clutch, so we'll see how long that lasts. The seats here, they need some refresh as well. I would like to have it reupholstered, maybe change the color of the leather, have it professionally done. Um, but right now that's probably like way later down the list. Another thing too, this paint, you know, original paint, I'm very happy with that. There's no micro scratches. The guy who owned this before, pretty sure he did everything hand wash. But a few weeks ago, I was driving, enjoying myself, and it was windy. I saw this metal sheet on the floor. I thought it was aluminum. And it was right when I approached it, the sheet basically flew up and smacked the front of my car and then tumbled all the way back. I was hoping that it was just a aluminum foil. However, when I got home, I looked at it and it was a metal sheet. I don't know if it was like a construction sign that was just lying on the floor, but like I said, with my luck, as soon as I approached it, it just flew off from the ground and then smacked the front end and scratched everything on its way out. Luckily, it didn't smack me in the face. So that's the list. Suspension, timing chain tensioners, seats, paint, well, at least for now. You know, that's the whole thing with having an older sports car or project car is the list can keep growing. You know, the older me probably would have saved up for coilovers, exhausts, headers, different wheels, but when something did go wrong, you know, it being an older sports car, I probably wouldn't have been able to come up with those costs. So this is what it's like to eat your vegetables. Another thing I forgot to mention too, these wheels, have, I don't know what it is, brake dust, but it's basically caked onto it. It looks disgusting. I would like to get this refinished. Uh, headlights are starting to get a little bit faded. I would like this restored and then put some PPF on it so that way it saves itself from the Vegas sun. So yeah, right off the bat, the car cost me money. If I didn't love this thing as much as I do, I probably would have sold it by now. But let's just see how many strikes that I give this car. But yeah, as of now, two months of owning this thing, this is still one of my favorite cars. I don't wanna get rid of it unless it's to get another one or if this engine explodes. And that's something that you have to think about when you buy a sports car like this is, you know, what do you value the most? You know, is it the deal of the car? Is it the looks, the performance, the sound, the nostalgia and the sentiment? Is it the zero to 60? Is it the clout? To me, it's more so the sentiment with this car. You know, like I explained in previous videos, this is something that I've always been dreaming of owning way back since high school. So it's just really cool to be able to experience this and live with it at, you know, relatively an early stage of my life. And I know there's definitely more capable, better value sports cars out there. Like for example, the ND2, ND3 Miata is way more capable in every way compared to this. And you know, it's more comfortable. You have a warranty with it. It's definitely more reliable. You have CarPlay, more livable essentially. But for me, it's just not something that I ever dreamed of owning. You know, no offense to the Miata community. You know, I love those cars. I love what Mazda is doing. But me personally, I've never dreamt of owning a Miata. It made the most sense to get that car over this, but this is just something that I've always been wanting since I was younger. And it's just really cool to, you know, kind of live out my high school dreams at 30 years old. And then also too, this thing just looks cool as hell. Like I still get compliments from it. It surprises me that, you know, the kids riding their bikes in my neighborhood, they give it a compliment that tells you how timeless this design is. Whenever I pull up to a gas station, people say something, neighbors walking around, they're asking if it's a Miata. They said that they had something similar to it in the past. Whenever I'm driving around, bikers will give me nods or thumbs up. So to me, what I like with this car too is the looks, the appreciation comes from like actual genuine car people. So yeah, the car looks and sounds good. I can't and probably will never get over either of those. 
And then I just know with the refresh how much better it can look, refreshing all of the parts, how much newer it can feel again. All right, so that's enough rambling. Let me go ahead and talk more about this car while I drive it. Let me talk about how it drives. And we're gonna try roof up because I'm still testing out this whole audio situation. So we'll talk about several things, suspension, steering, gearing, gear ratios, gearbox, and then obviously the engine. Let me talk first about the suspension on this. So I'm learning a little bit more about this car as you know, I still watch reviews on it. It has double wishbone suspension through all four corners. Everyone says, you know, double wishbone suspension is just better to have. I don't know why it makes it better. I don't know what it does exactly to the car. So I looked it up. Let me try to briefly explain it. The benefit of having a double wishbone suspension is basically when you're putting more load onto the corner. So basically when you're turning hard, when you're cornering hard, it adds negative camber to the wheel itself apparently, thus causing more tire contact to the surface and therefore better handling. So I don't know if that's right. That's just what I briefly looked up. Let me know in the comments. And then with it essentially being a front mid-engine car, I know you're not supposed to call it front mid-engine and they call it like a mid-ship platform. Basically, this is it brings the engine block behind the front axles. The benefit of that is, imagine you have an empty shopping cart and you know next time you go grocery shopping, grab a case of water and then just put it all the way to the far edge or the front end of the shopping cart and then just try to turn it in and see how much more effort it requires and then bring that case of water closer to you and then just try turning it and see how much more easier it is to you know turn that car that's essentially what it's like driving with this car you know you have all this weight pushed as close to you as much as possible without being a true mid-engine or a rear engine car the turn-in is just so much more responsive doesn't take much effort to steer the car to point the car and you know with it also being a lightweight car very low and planted the handling and the suspension of this car is actually as good as good as everyone makes it out to be and then mind you i mean you know i'm still on oem suspension you know like i said earlier i would like to refresh it and i'm just imagining how much better how much better it could feel i know maybe i could do coilovers but i Remember when the owner was telling me why he never put coilovers on the car, it says it meshes with the geometry of the differential and therefore eventually, you know, puts further stress onto it. And then the gearbox. The gearbox is really good. You know, it, this is what I learned. It does take some time to warm it up. I think after the first 20 shifts, it's buttery smooth, very tactile feeling, short throws, nice weight to it. But when you first start it, when you're shifting through gears, it's very crunchy. It feels like you're grinding every time you go into a gear. It's not, it feels like you're damaging the synchros. But I've learned from everyone in the comments and forums, it's very common with the uh, S2000. And then let's talk about the gear ratios. So first gear brings you, I think, to 28 or 32 miles an hour. Second gear brings you low 50s and then when you're top of third gear you're in the low 70s so you can really ring out the engine in this car without going jail speeds i keep mentioning that and to me that's probably one of my favorite parts about this car let me show you right now scenarios versus you have some crazy supercar like a 911 or a Cayman you know top of second gear you're already at like 80 miles an hour probably what I notice a lot about this car and everyone else talks about it too is just the sensation of speed that this car brings you I don't know if it's because you're in an old school sports car or if you're lower in the ground because you're in a lightweight car with not as much you know safety technology it's not hiding the speed like most sports cars these days do but it's just that sensation of speed that this car brings you when you're really ringing out the gears when you're really pushing it 
it feels like you're going so fast. Imagine your first time snowboarding, first time skiing, whatever it is. You feel like you're flying. Your peripherals are just going so fast past you. When you have someone take a video of you, you look back at it, it looks super lame. You know, you're only going like five, maybe 10 miles an hour. You're not going that fast as you thought you were. That's kind of how it is with this car. You know, it feels like you're going so much faster than you actually are. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's a slow sports car compared to, you know, more modern sports cars these days. But if it feels like you're going super fast and you're having a lot of fun and there's a lot of drama to it, there's nothing wrong with that. And that brings me on to kind of my next rant about fun. term you know for some people fun is going 0 to 60 in under three seconds fun can be taking your exotic car to go grocery shopping at Costco overlanding camping going to track days ripping in the canyons it could be anything and basically when you get a fun car like this or something like a Hellcat M3, 911, whatever it is, you just try to find that fun that doesn't get old to you, if that makes sense. And that's what this car has been to me. It's a different type of fun, but something that I miss the most out of the other cars that I have. I don't know if it's the convertible experience and just being able to enjoy the weather. I don't know if it's the nostalgic factor. I don't know if it's the 8,000 RPM, you know, high revving VTEC, but like I said, I've had this for two months now and I'm still not getting tired of it. And that's something that I hope I never get tired of. Basically, you just gotta find something that suits your personality the most. good it sounds even from outside it sounds like you're at a racetrack when you hear someone driving your car and it's just something that I probably will never get tired of and something that you don't get in most modern affordable sports cars these days you probably could experience it in something but you have to spend like over a hundred thousand dollars just to get that you know you have Civic Type R, STI, Golf R, everything with the you know OEM exhaust it doesn't sound as exciting, not compared to this at least. But I mean, you do have Mustangs, Camaros, Challengers, any like modern American car these days. Those ones sound really good, I have to give it to them. So, I had this for two months now. What do I use this car for? Definitely not driving it to work, but it's more like the ultimate weekend car for me. And just finding any type of excuse to drive it. You know, it could be me and my wife were getting ready for bed and then just randomly I asked her if she wants to go for a drive just to grab some snacks just for the sake of it. Driving it to the park, bringing my son to the park just cause, bringing my dog to the dog park or just driving out around this time of the day when the sun's coming down you're not burning and just enjoying you know the drop top experience. This car is just like a straight up toy for me. daily drive this or could I daily drive this absolutely not it's cramped in here loud when you have the top up when you bring it down it's more you know not as bad but also if you're driving around in a convertible broad daylight in Vegas summer and you're burning in there I wouldn't recommend that you get really sweaty you get tired after 10 minutes ride itself is pretty rough. I don't know if it's because it's a low sports car, I don't know if it's because it's 20 year old suspension, or I don't know if it's a combination of both, but you know, it does kind of beat you up when you don't have perfect roads. this on a trip no longer than 40 minutes so how do I typically drive this how have I learned to drive it basically you just want to stay in the upper RPM so about like four to six thousand 
and that's kind of the benefit too of having a stock exhaust is you know when you're just keeping up with traffic or just trying to zip through it doesn't sound like you're trying so hard you're not being obnoxious and even with the stock exhaust it sounds good it sounds loud enough and you get to experience the engine sound more than the exhaust and then also too you don't have to deal with drone and then going back to this topic about speed yeah as a sports car you know it having little to no torque everyone says it's slow it's not actually that slow at least when you put a lot of effort into it but even then once you get it going once you're staying in the mid-range you're still zipping through a lot of traffic it's still faster than most cars out there so it's not completely like an old Honda Civic you know this car makes what 240 horsepower 170 pound feet of torque it's not terrible super lightweight very nimble it doesn't have as much you know safety regulations so going back to it you feel like you're going a lot faster than you are it's still not as slow as everyone makes it seem so two months later 700 miles what's my conclusion with this car honestly for me it's the experience of owning your high school dream car you know that nostalgia factor being able to kind of curate your playlist that you listened to back in the day and then play it as you're driving around without any direction in this car that's where i find myself enjoying it the most you know everyone says i should be taking it to the track driving it in the canyons or the back roads i'm pretty sure i'm going to do that eventually but i still just got this car if you think about it it has almost 100,000 miles i don't know what's on its way out and the car already left me stranded so i'm still i'm still learning for this car and then once i feel confident with it once i trust it once i feel like i got everything dialed in then i'll come back to the thought of you know bringing to the track the canyons the back road things like that but right now it's just more so experiencing the car just driving it randomly to the gas station to grab snacks or you know bugging my wife to come out with me and enjoy the weather random things like that you know my wife enjoys this car i feel super young when driving it i feel like i'm living my high school dream and you know nothing is wrong with feeling young i feel like that's so underrated I'm not saying that i'm super old i'm only 30 i'm turning 31 and the older you get you get into your career you get married you start building a family your responsibilities start piling up the bills start getting more expensive there's more obstacles that you have to go through the older you get and you know just getting into a car like this playing your old playlist I feel like erases all of that at least temporarily like to me this car has just been straight therapy every time I take it out I'm happy that this car lives up to all of the expectations that I built up for it. I know I only had it for about two months now, and I'm still learning it, I'm probably still honeymooning, but I hope none of that ever changes. And, you know, I just want to enjoy this, take care of it as long as I can, you know, maybe eventually take it to the track, maybe, you know, bring it out to the mountain or the canyons without getting stranded there. But yeah, that's about it for this video. You know, let me know what you guys think. Do you feel like this car is still worth it in 2024? You know, what other options would you have? What's the absolute max price that you would pay for this? Because... Because the prices on these things are kind of skyrocketing. It's kind of absurd. 20 to 30 grand for a for a 20 year old sports car. Or I don't know, maybe that's just like the old Japanese sports car tax. I can't say JDM because it's technically not JDM because it's the left hand drive, whatever. And then let me know, you know, if you have one, what's your favorite part about this car? If you sold one in the past, do you ever plan on getting back into this platform? Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys learned something. Keep chasing your dream cars. And as always, take care and be safe out there. Thank you, bye.